The topic for the next 20 minutes, give or take, is an update on the traditional standard becoming obsolete somewhat, systemic therapy for atopic dermatitis. So the medications are still relative and pertinent, but they're slowly becoming obsolete, and you'll hear about the new ones after I'm done. What the hell is atopic dermatitis, this chronic, unrelenting, <sighs> Skin disease characterized by dermatitis, eczema, itch. It can be short-lived, it can be lifetime. 20-25% uh, of kids are affected by it. Maybe 2-4% to of adults are affected by it. And it definitely affects the quality of life of the individual, as well as close family members, even folks at work. What do you do about treatment? Treatment can be multidisciplinary, meaning many specialties, family medicine, pediatrics, internal medicine, of course, dermatology. A lot of factors go into it, the laying on of the hands, herbal remedies, uh, mother's remedies, what's roaming the, what, what you find roaming the drugstore shelves and aisles, et cetera. But the standard treatment is usually predicated on the use of topical medications. And these don't need to be prescriptions. They can be simply emollients and creams, Aquaphor, Vaseline, and then you move into topical corticosteroids, maybe some environmental changes, maybe addressing some of the triggers that keep it, keep it going, and then ultimately, hopefully, phototherapy if you don't want to go the way of a pill. Treatment in the clinic, what's available most of the time? I think most of us will reach for emollients. Get greasy, lubricate, Moisturize. For those who spend time with me, it's dry skin, lubricate, lubricate, lubricate. Whether you have the dermatitis or not, it's a damn good idea. And most patients, most patients get the lubrication plus the topical corticosteroids. As far as commonly prescribed systemic medicines, antibiotics lead the list, not prednisone. Antibiotics, almost 20% of the adult and kitty population who make their way to the clinic receive a prescription for an antibiotic, uh, even without infection being present. Next up, antihistamines and systemic corticosteroids to a degree. I'll come to that later. It should not be something we lean on with any great regularity. The group of patients who receive systemic corticosteroids most often are guys in a wide range, wide age range, from roughly age 20, 25 to about the age of 60. There's a little difference, a little less so at younger age and a little more so at older age. But what about systemic therapy? There is a place for it. How do you make the decision? Well, thanks to the International Council on Eczema, which was published, their findings were published in the journal, the Academy, the Blue Journal, we need to think of a few factors before we reach for the pill, before we write for the prescription for cyclosporin or methotrexate. Number one, do you have the correct diagnosis? Is it atopic dermatitis? Could it be an extensive form of seborrheic dermatitis? Could it be PRP? Could it be an acute uh, or uh, allergic contact dermatitis? Has topical therapy been optimized? Have you used emollients? Have you used topical corticosteroids? And not in the weak sense, prescription level, middle of the road, maybe right up to the tougher ones, the stronger ones uh, for the hands and the feet, the elbows and the knees. Have you thought about phototherapy for that chronic dermatitis? Is there a presence of coexisting infections, cellulitis, impetigo, that hasn't been adequately addressed, which will compromise your use or make you pause before you reach for a systemic drug? adequate education. The patient, the family needs to know that the disease waxes and wanes, goes ups and downs. If you throw everything at it, they may still have an exacerbation. If it's under control, they may still break through even with therapy. So they need to be aware of it and be aware of triggers as well, whatever kicks it off. Comorbidities, they could be atopic comorbidities, asthma, hay fever, rhinitis. They could be infectious comorbidities, such as an impetigo or a cellulitis. And there can be other comorbidities, for example, for example, coexisting disease, chronic infection, diabetes, alcohol abuse if you're planning to use a systemic medication. And then obviously the disease impact on the patient, whether it's a kid or an adult, and the quality of life for the patient and the family member. But disease severity alone by itself, looking at a patient who might have 80 or 90 percent of the skin covered is not a reason by itself to reach for a pill, to reach for systemic therapy. I think it plays into that consideration, but it's not the sole determining factor factor. I lifted this from the Blue Journal. This is simply a listing of phototherapy and more and some of the more commonly prescribed or at least considered systemic agents. And I highlighted three. 
cyclosporin, azathioprine, and methotrexate in that order as the three that are probably the most efficacious, the most reasonable, and the most helpful. I could have extended it one more line to mycophenolic acid, but here it's a little less striking, a little bit more dubious, a little less certain, so I'm going to eliminate that one and focus on the first three. I lifted this one also from the uh, from a journal, the Journal of the European Academy of Dermatology, and it simply lists those three main medicines, including mycophenolic acid on the far column. And if you look at the, the clinical scores based on studies, cyclosporin really leads the list. The clinical score as far as efficacy and effect, 60 to almost 95 percent plus, compared to azathioprine, methotrexate, and mycophenolic acid, which are about half that. Treatment period, cyclosporin wins. Most studies have uh, looked at it for up to a year, the other three drugs only for about six months, give or take. And the period of treatment trial itself, again, up to a year, but only about half a year with the others. Time to response, look at that first column. Cyclosporin kicks in at about two to four weeks, give or take. The others take a little bit longer, perhaps up to about two months. Most important side effects, I'll cover these individually. It's mainly hematologic, and it's mainly GI, but for cyclosporin, it's elevated uh, serum creatinine and hypertension. Fathering and mothering, cyclosporin pretty much allows both to happen. The other two are pretty much verboten if those are the plans. So for the systemic agents for moderate to severe atopic dermatitis, think of three in this order. Cyclosporin for short-term therapy, azathioprine as second-line therapy, and methotrexate as a decent second-line choice as well. Mycophenolic acid, I'm sorry, mycophenolic mafetal, it's okay if you've already gone through the first three and you're looking for something new, different, give it a shot. Not a bad idea, but not as good a choice. Not as good a choice as the first three. Interferon, IVIG, systemic corticosteroids as ongoing systemic therapy should be avoided. There might be a place for it in a research study, if everybody else, if patients have tried everything else, et cetera, but really not much credibility to those. One by one, cyclosporin, a drug that's been around for two, three decades almost, suppresses cytokine gene expression, decreases the presence of T cells in interleukin-2, and its main indication in medicine is for graft-versus-host disease. It is used for some skin diseases, primarily psoriasis and atopic dermatitis, and it has been in play for atopic dermatitis for almost 20 years. 1991 was the first time. The dosing of this, if you don't know, is anywhere between 3 to 5 milligrams per kilogram per day in divided dose. So it's one in the morning, one at night. And it's usually prescribed for a period of time of up to two, four, five, six months, and that's it. As patients get better, you taper the medication. When they're good and controlled, you stop it. You can use it on an intermittent basis. Some studies have actually shown that it could be used two to three times a week for a long period of time, and it has a very rapid onset, usually two to three weeks, a month at best, and it's even better if you use the microemulsion formulation. Adverse effects, the two you should remember with cyclosporum hypertension, it raises the blood pressure, and increased levels of creatinine, so it is somewhat nephrotoxic. After that, GI distress, that's aches and pains, a uh, little nausea, a little vomiting, maybe a little bit of the runs, infection a little bit, headache, gingival hyperplasia, excess hair growth, uh, maybe I should take it, you're working with me, that's good, we're approaching lunch, that's good. But for this one, it's mainly hypertension elevated creatinine, just keep it in mind. And the higher the dose, if you approach the five milligram per kilogram per day in divided dose, a greater likelihood of side effects. Lab test, the usual gamish. CBC, um, metabolic panel, et cetera, and the same tests at follow-up, usually on a every two week to every four week basis, give or take, and more, more testing on a regular basis at a higher dose. The pros for cyclosporin, Markedly better than placebo in five randomly controlled trials. Um, markedly better, somewhere between 55 and 95 percent efficacy, better results with cyclosporin. Short-term treatment, you'll see good results probably within six to eight weeks, and you can continue it for up to a year if you're inclined. Good results also with only one study regarding quality of life. The drug itself is markedly superior to systemic corticosteroids, specifically prednisolone, also better than IVIG, 
and uh, ultraviolet light, and that's in head-to-head -head studies. And it's similarly efficacious to mycophenolic acid, but usually the mycophenolic acid held its own in conjunction with systemic corticosteroids. So this drug is good. It's damn good for short-term use, used judiciously, used thoughtfully, and you can even use it for up to a year, give or take, but data supporting its use in that frame uh, is a little limited. Adverse reactions, anywhere between about 1 and 25 percent on a weekly basis, but not enough to withdraw the medication. So people may have an adverse event, uh, event, blood pressure goes up a little bit, creatinine goes up a little bit, but not enough to stop the medication. No serious adverse events with cyclosporin. The weekly rate was less than 2%, not bad at all, and absolutely no serious adverse events with cyclosporin. So the take-home point for cyclosporin, pretty good, pretty damn good, and recommended for short-term treatment for patients with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. Quick onset, within about two months, uh, I'm sorry, within about two, two to three weeks, you can use it for six months. You can use it as long as a year. It works well. Side effects are not a limiting factor. Question about long-term use, you can use it up to a year, give or take, but long-term safety remains a problem. The main caveat here, it's not to be used. It should not be used. It is not recommended. Do I need to say that more emphatically? For infants and young children. Now, the pediatric dermatologists in the room and others who use this drug may quibble with that and say, ah, Ken, you really can. I'm simply sharing with you the caveat in the literature, not for infants and young kids. Maybe age 7, 8, 9 and older and teenagers, sure, and definitely adults. Think about that. And definitely a good drug of choice for those who have compromised or uh, uh, adjusted quality of life issues. Azathioprine, drug that's been around for decades. This is a purine antagonist. It inhibits the production of DNA. It blocks those rapidly dividing B cells and T cells, and it cuts down on T cell proliferation. The key point, a good board question for this drug is the metabolism. Metabolism here is somewhat dependent on an enzyme. TPMT, thiopurine methyltransferase, a good board question. I'd put that one aside for you. Remember that when you take an exam. And remember that also if you prescribe this drug for patients. You need to check that enzyme level to see how uh, present it is, whether it's working well or not, because your dosing will depend on that. It's this approved treatment for transplant patients to prevent rejection. It's also been used for rheumatoid arthritis with a fair degree of regularity. And it's used in skin disease, primarily atopic dermatitis, and obviously, like cyclosporin, off-label. The dosing here, one to two and a half milligrams per kilogram per day, and you increase it gradually. You don't jump in. You do this step by step, inch by inch, et cetera. You do it gradually, and you'll see an effect usually in about eight to 10 weeks, give or take. Some patients will have a delayed response simply because their enzyme activity is either compromised or low, and the enzyme is the thiopurine methyltransferase. Adverse effects, primarily the gut and the blood system. So the GI distress is nausea, vomiting, a little bit of the runs, maybe some inability to eat, digest, the heaves, bloating, et cetera. The life goes on, but it affects the gut, so you need to be aware of that. Less commonly, liver function tests can be elevated, so there's an element of hepatotoxicity with this. Headache, fever, rash can be somewhat myelosuppressive. Need to keep that in mind. And there's often a depressed, a, a depressed white count, meaning there's leukopenia. Infection, cancer, jury's really out on that. There have been reports, but not to any great extent. Not as much as the GI distress. The tests for this drug, if you prescribe it, the usual array, a CBC, chemical profile. And the enzyme needs to be tested as well. You need to look for that, the activity of the thiopurine methyltransferase, the TPMT. You need to do that. And then you get, the besides the usual array, HIV, hepatitis B and C, and a TB test as well. Follow-up testing thereafter, usually every two weeks for at least two months, and then once a month for about four months, give or take, and then every other month, and a yearly TB test if the patient continues on azathioprine for more than a year. The pros for the use of azathioprine, 
pretty good. I mean, in two randomly controlled trials, it showed good efficacy compared to placebo. Anything compared to placebo is going to show some benefit, 26 to 37 percent, not bad. So roughly a third of the patients did better than those who received placebo. So not bad numbers. And it is very comparable to methotrexate, which I'll cover next, and equally efficacious regarding a scoring system known in uh, the, the Durham realm. Almost 40 percent at 12 weeks, more than that at 24, and quality of life numbers are pretty good too. Not very high, 20, 25 percent at 12 weeks, a little higher later on. But the efficacy, the effectiveness of azathioprine compared to placebo, pretty good. Compared to methotrexate, pretty good as well. The cons, unlike cyclosporin, the adverse reactions a little bit more present. The uh, adverse reaction on a weekly basis, somewhere between 5 and 25 percent, but usually not enough to discontinue the drug. And the main one is a depressed white count. So with azathioprine, just be aware of the blood count. The white count might be on the low side. So the weekly withdrawal rate, pretty much close to zero, certainly less than 1 percent. But at 24 weeks, six months, approximately 9 to 10 percent of folks have discontinued the drug because of side effects, or the dose has been adjusted, usually decreased in about 9 to 10 percent at that same interval based on side effects. But the overall riding concern here is no serious side effects with azathioprine. Take home point, a good drug. Certainly a very efficacious and effective drug for the treatment of systemic, I'm sorry, severe or moderate atopic dermatitis as a second-line choice. Let cyclosporin be your first choice, but this is a decent one for short-term use, maybe up to about six months, give or take, but the overall efficacy less than cyclosporin. So this is the cousin. This is the second cousin, the third cousin, the first cousin. The blood relative is cyclosporin, but just remember to check that enzyme level. Methotrexate, well, we're doing well on time. Methotrexate, we all lean on methotrexate a lot. I lean on it a lot for psoriasis, for atopic dermatitis. I think the residents think this is our first drug after we've used cyclosporin for a while. And indeed, it can be, it should be, but it's probably our third choice. It should be our third choice. This is a folic acid uh, antagonist. It inhibits purine and pyrimidine synthesis. That's the chemical structure in the upper right-hand corner. It blocks the production of DNA and RNA, and it inhibits T cell function. Okay, that's the chemistry. What do you use this drug for? Well, you use it for cancer. It's an anti-cancer drug. You use it dermatologically for psoriasis and chronic dermatitis, including atopic dermatitis. And again, off-label. And the reason it's off-label is there aren't enough controlled, effective trials that can actually justify its use. The dosing, half a milligram per kilogram per day on a week, I'm sorry, half, half a milligram per kilogram on a weekly basis. Maximum dose should probably be no more than 25 milligrams on a weekly basis. 30 if you're really pushing it, if it's a big guy or a big woman who's healthy. But 25 should probably be your max. And that drug should always be coupled with one milligram of folic acid or folate on a daily basis. You do not need to skip the day that methotrexate is given. We argue about that in clinic a little bit. The argument, I'm up here, I'll be the expert at the moment. You can give it every day. Folic acid every day and methotrexate once a week. It works slowly. So if you're looking for a quick effect, it's not going to happen. It's going to take 8 to 10 weeks. And if you start off gradually with the medication, as you should, a la azathioprine, you may not see much of a benefit for about two months, give or take. So be patient. But the nice thing is it's usually well tolerated because you're simply administering it once a week. Adverse effects. Bingo. Once again, it's hematologic and it's GI, probably GI more than anything else. Nausea, some GI distress. You just don't feel right in the gut. Things just aren't right. They don't feel copacetic, whether you've had spicy foods or not. I took methotrexate today. I didn't. And then tomorrow, the next 24 hours, you're just not feeling well. Pulmonary fibrosis, we often forget about that. Well, we don't need to remember, maybe, but it can occur. So you need to be aware of prescribing the drug for those patients who have history of bronchitis, who are smokers, who have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, et cetera. And it can suppress the bone marrow, so you need to be aware of that. Laboratory tests, the usual array, CBC, chemical profile, 
plus hepatitis B, C, HIV, TB, and if it's a patient with pulmonary disease, you might want to consider sending that patient off for a pulmonary function tests with your friendly pulmonologist. Might not be a bad idea if you're planning to use methotrexate in an oldster with pulmonary disease or even with a middle-aged individual with pulmonary disease or at least some pulmonary compromise. Testing on a regular basis, at least monthly, then every two weeks thereafter for another month or so, and then thereafter about every two to three months, give or take, for as long as the patient takes methotrexate. Now with a parental administration, red light is on, I know it's, it's the orange light, parental administration, which is something we don't think about very often because it's always easier to prescribe a pill. But parental administration of methotrexate, meaning subcutaneous administration, is markedly, or I won't say markedly, it's dramatically more effective, better tolerated, et cetera. The first bullet point, better linear pharmacokinetics. What does that mean? It means the improvement takes off on a straight line rather than that sloping curve. So a straight line rise as far as efficacy and improvement, et cetera, much better than that sloping line. So better linear pharmacokinetics with sub-Q methotrexate than PO methotrexate. Better bioavailability. You're delivering it more easily, more quickly. It's being absorbed and taken into the system much more quickly and readily than the GI route. And better tolerability. If you just look at the bar graphs here, comparing sub-Q to PO methotrexate, less nausea, less vomiting, no vomiting, no loss of appetite or about the same, no abdominal pain, no diarrhea. I mean, life is better as far as the gut is concerned. So it's just something to think about. I won't go into the specifics of sub-Q administration. It's in the book. We can share it later in the back of the room. So the pros for methotrexate, similar efficacy to azathioprine. Not bad. It's very comparable. Same numbers for improvement regarding the scoring system, quality of life numbers, and in head-to-head -head trials, markedly better uh, than the um, challenging drug, almost 50% better at six months, give or take. Adverse effects, you can watch the number go up, more than cyclosporin, more than azathioprine, but the weekly adverse effects here, about a quarter of patients will experience them, but fortunately, not enough of the side effects to withdraw the medication. No serious side effects, but five to 6% of folks will withdraw it completely because of side effects at the six month interval, and 10% at least will require a dose adjustment. The take home point, not a bad drug. Maybe not the first line of treatment, maybe not the second, but it's there for the third line. And I think some of us will actually use this as a first line drug, certainly as a second line drug. Maybe we should slip azathioprine in as a second line drug before we reach for methotrexate. Just remember, the efficacy is similar to azathioprine, but the data not as good. Other systemic agents that are in the repertoire that we could prescribe and write for, mycophenolic acid, it's okay, I think it's a distant fourth choice. If you're in love with the drug, you're comfortable with it, you've gotten good results, fine. Interferon uh, gamma, plus minus efficacy, we don't know about long-term safety, how it's tolerated, et cetera. And pomecrolimus, it's okay, we just don't know enough about it in the systemic form. The last five are in the literature, case reports, very small series of patients, probably should not be used. Not that they're verboten, but just not strongly recommended because there's just not enough data about them. Montelukas, IVIG, even Mycobacterium vacai has been used as treatment for it, and traditional Chinese herbal uh, therapy, not a good idea. What about other systemic agents? What else has been used? Systemic corticosteroids. That's probably a very commonly in employed systemic agent. Uh, hopefully on a short-term basis, just to get somebody over the hump, over that exacerbation, over the acute flare, et cetera. But it should not be used. It should not be used. It should not be used. Three times on a regular basis. It should be avoided. Limited efficacy, it's okay for a short while, but not for long-term use. Even at a low dose, even on an every other day dose, even on a, oh, I'll take it on Saturday and I'll feel better for the next five days. No, no, no. Try to avoid it. Too many systemic effects. Antibiotics, sure, we use them a lot. Use them for infection. Use them if the patient has cellulitis and impetigo, um, something in that realm. 
But if you're simply using it to clean up colonization, no. Keeping in mind that atopic dermatitis patients are regularly colonized with Staph aureus, probably to the tune of about 80, 85 percent of the time. General population, it's only about 30 or 30 percent. And MRSA colonizes atopic skin about 15 to 20 percent of the time. But knowing that is not justification to prescribe an antibiotic in pill form. Antiviral agents, if you have herpetic disease, whether it's shingles or HSV, there's a place for it, otherwise not. And the last slide, antihistamines. We probably use this more than we should, but the answer here is no. These should not be used as standard, regular treatment for patients with atopic dermatitis. There's just not enough good evidence for that. Fine for short-term use. Here and there, especially for folks, patients who can't sleep because of the itch, it's a tough weekend, give a presentation, they're traveling a little bit, they need to sleep, need, need to sleep, antihistamines are okay short term, but not a substitute for topical care, meaning emollients and topical corticosteroids. And the non-sedating antihistamines, we reach for those a little bit simply because, well, they can function. But unless you've got some urticaria or some atopic conditions, um, asthma, hay fever, allergic rhinitis, et cetera, there really is no place for the non-sedating antihistamines as far as therapy for uh, atopic dermatitis.